Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. Very thrilled to have a very wonderful guest that we that I love to have back in the show again and again because he is a very important scholar in one aspect of the Neapolitan tradition that is not as focused on, which is the initial part of their training, which is the three years of solfeggio. And this is the great Professor Nicholas Baragwaneth. Professor Baragwaneth, welcome back to the show. Hi, Nikhil. Nice, nice to be here. Well, I wanted to just get a little update. You know, your fantastic book, The Solfeggio Tradition, has been out for, for a while. How's the response been? And can you give me a little update on, like, uh, developments since the release of this book? Well, it's been fairly well uh, received, but I think people still are a little bit scared. Uh, this is still, uh, two years later, a new method. Um, I have had some scholars writing to me and and showing some work they've done in this area. But everybody's still a little bit tentative uh, because it's so unfamiliar to most people. And I think uh, many scholars, as well as practitioners, are scared of getting it wrong. Um, so I have been teaching, uh, doing some lessons with uh, practitioners, scholars, musicians uh, around the world. And things are moving. But basically, I need to pull my finger out and I need to do a bit of work. Because <laughs> uh, what we really need uh, are uh, solmized versions. We need training textbook versions of these manuscript sources. At the moment, the manuscripts are still very difficult to find. You know, many of them are in archives. They're not digitized and, and this sort of thing. So I think my job now, and I have been working on this, uh, is to publish uh, critical editions of some of these solfeggio uh, sources uh, with a commentary, with a commentary from me as a how I think they would have been used and how they uh, teach, uh, how you use them, what you learn from them and so on. Um, so that's a project which is in hand. It's going to take a while. Uh, I think we're going to need a few of these things and we're going to need people to be actually uh, incorporating it into their own practice in some ways. Right. And this has started in, in terms of scholars. Some scholars are now starting to use uh, the hexachordal shapes as part of schemata, for instance, the shapes and basic stock patterns uh, in music of the period. And they actually tell you quite a bit more than, than the numbers, the modern scale degree numbers. So there's some interesting work happening at the moment. And so I, I want just, I know for all the insiders who watch my show, they know exactly what you're about. But again, I think we should always just kind of frame it for people who are always new to this. So what is solfeggio in the traditional Italian uh, way? And is that the same thing as movable dough or fixed dough? People are always asking that question. <laughs> yeah, it's so the first thing to say, it's not the same as any modern system. It's not fixed dough. It's not movable dough. It's a hexachordal system. Uh, those of you who know anything about Renaissance and medieval music will be familiar with this a little bit. The do, re, mi, fa, sol, la of Guido d'Arezzo. Um, uh, but it's really unfamiliar to most musicians who are not into early music. However, in the 18th century, that is the system they still use, the kind of updated version of it. Now, um, I won't go into the technical details of that now, but I will say that solfeggio was the first part of training. So for professional musicians, when they did a 10-year apprenticeship, usually, uh, they would be indentured either in a church school or an orphanage or with a maestro uh, somewhere in the family, perhaps. And the first thing they learned was solfeggio and taught many things. It's not just one thing. It's not like modern solfeggio where you're learning to score read, for instance, and pitch notes. It's much more than that. So they would start off learning to read. And they, they had a system of reading, which is, if you don't know it from my book, it's unbelievable because they could read any key, any clef, absolutely effortlessly. Unlike we can't do this anymore. I mean, certainly if someone gives me a baritone clef and a tenor clef and a different keys, I'm really going to struggle with that. Uh, but back in those days, uh, because they read clefts in a completely different way from us, they, they learned to read in any key. It was absolutely amazing. So that's the first thing they did. Then they learned um, how to uh, sing expressively. So if you're singing very simple scales, for instance, you never sing them simply. simply. They're never just do, re, mi. They were always sung with some kind of ornamentation, some kind of phrasing, some musicality. And so... 
at its more advanced level, it's actually teaching skills in composition, improvisation, uh, singing, uh, and it's it's fundamental. It's absolutely fundamental to uh, the system. Partimento, which came next, if you went on after you passed your exams, it could be three years, it could be longer. Some students took more than three years. Uh, they weren't allowed to progress until they proved their worth in the solfeggio. And after that, they would usually do uh, partimento if they were serious, or they might go on to a different instrument. They might learn violin or, or cello or something else. But partimento was there to teach you the harmony. So in solfeggio, remember, they never, unless they're a, a, a bass singer, which is a different thing altogether, mm. uh, they didn't know the bass line. They didn't know how to read the bass even, in a sense. They, mm. they, they were learning melodies. And so with partimento, they start to learn the bass and they learn about chords and how chords go together. Partimento is all about putting chords together. That's why in partimento, they don't really talk about melody because it's not about melody. Uh, if you take it to its very advanced uh, level, like a Bach prelude, of course, you need knowledge of solfeggio to do that. But uh, partimento, as we know it, from Fenaroli, from Furno, from these rules, is really about linking chords together and, and you know, uh, voice leading, how, how one voice goes to another. So with your hands in partimento, you would learn uh, how the chords all fit together, which is a different skill. It's a very, very different skill. Right. And then finally, you might go on to composition lessons, which involve counterpoint and things like instrumentation and the various skills you'd need to be a composer. So solfeggio is the first three or four years. Um, it's a little bit painful at first because you have to learn the, the, the alphabet. And that's the first thing you learn in solfeggio. But actually, I'm going to try today to make, show you how it's interesting because it taught a lot more than just how to name a note. It, it taught how to structure phrasing, how to control rhythm, how to control cadences, uh, right. how to write a melody, in short. Right. So, yeah, so, uh, I've got a few examples. Uh, one, 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 uh, before we dive into the examples, Professor Barguanath, um, I, I have just a quick history question. So you have a brilliant book called The Italian Traditions, Puccini. You've written this book. It's a great book. Can I ask you, in the 19th century, for instance, someone like Bellini, Puccini, Verdi, were they aware of this sort of solfeggio or, or had it died out by then? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I can, in the case of Bellini, I can be quite explicit and say that, yes, he did know this system because he studied with Zingarelli. And uh, Zingarelli in Naples was one of the kind of last bastions of the old ways. You know, right. Zingarelli trained in the 1760s in Naples. So he was a very old man when Bellini studied with him. And in any case, uh, Bellini, when he studied in um, Catania, his, his uh, Sicilian uh, uh, native city, uh, he studied with his grandfather. And his grandfather also studied in Naples in the 1760s. <laughs> so I think we can be fairly sure that this is the system he used. And his music does, in fact, correspond. Bellini died in 1831. Um, I think, was it 1835? I might have got that wrong. Anyway, uh, the, the system pretty much by then was dead, I, I would say. Mm. Uh, the evidence that I can see uh, shows me that really it dies out through the 1800s. Uh, e even in the 1800s, it's in trouble. And a lot of uh, places, Naples Conservatory, for instance, adopts the, the French fixed O system in the right. 1800s uh, because of French rule. And uh, all the conservatories start to reimagine themselves. Uh, this system was a system of um, craft training for apprentices. It's an apprenticeship model. And there was no more money or room for apprenticeships. Uh, there was right, no more right, career right. or industry for apprenticeships in the 1800s. So by the time you get to Verdi and his mid-period, I would say that it's a, a historical oddity. I'm, I'm pretty sure they would have been aware of it. Yeah. Um, uh, as something of the great tradition, of the great bel canto tradition. But right. I don't think it was being used by the time of Verdi. Okay. Okay, so let's go into the examples. I know a lot of people are excited. They want to see how is this done, for goodness sake. So let's get right into it then. Yeah. So <laughs> okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to do. So uh, people always say, well, how do you solmize these things? How do I know when something gets a syllable and which syllable and when it doesn't and so on? So I think the problem here is that most of the solfeggi that have come down to us are really quite advanced solfeggi. You know, because they're the nice ones. They're the ones that sound <laughs> like arias and melodies. Right. So they're the ones that were preserved. We don't have quite so many of the basic ones that were from the beginning. But, and here's the important thing, if you want to understand how the complex ones work, you have to work through the simple ones first. 
because the same patterns come back again and again, each time slightly more complicated, slightly more embellished. And so if, like me, you've actually gone through, you know, a whole series of these things from the simplest to the most complex, I can see quite easily that, ah, it's the same pattern. It just it realized in a different way. But if you go straight to the complex ones, you're going to really struggle. And I would struggle, in fact, if I go to a complex solfeggio and I don't know other solfeggi by that particular uh, author, then I'm really going to struggle to, to, to know what's going on. With some of them, um, I've kind of looked at all of them. So I know the patterns that are being taught and I know how they progress. So I'm going to try to show you how this works. What we've got in front of us is a solfeggio number seven from a collection of 115, uh, probably the single most important collection in the 18th century, by a Neapolitan maestro called Carlo Cotomacci. And Cotomacci taught for his whole life in Naples, basically. And he taught the solfeggio course. And his 115 lessons go from the really basic scales and so on to the most complex, complex uh, virtuoso melodies. And they were all solemnized in the same way. So what we've got here, if you can look at that, we've got here number seven. It's a very, very basic solfeggio. I'll just very quickly play it for you on the piano. Now, this shouldn't present any problems, really, for, for solmizing. Now, um, uh, I don't know how much to explain this. I'm going to assume that listeners roughly know what the hexachords mean. Mm. Uh, this melody is in G major, even though it doesn't have a sharp. That's very common in 18th century manuscripts. It's a G major melody. And we've got one triad. Tonic triad, yes, G major. So that that's solmized as sol mi do. Sol mi do. Yep, five, three, one, if you like. And then we have the triad in the dominant, D major. And that is also sol, mi, do, because there are two scales. One starts on G, and one starts on D. Those are the tonic and dominant notes of the key, and they have the same syllables, two overlapping scales. So the pattern at the beginning of this solfeggio is really obvious. Sol, mi, do, sol, mi, do. We're learning that you can have a theme based around the triad, tonic triad, and you can continue it with the same theme transposed to the dominant. And this, this is a standard way of, of constructing a melody. If you look at the end of the first line, fa mi re do, four, three, two, one in D major. That is an absolutely standard Kotomachi cadence. Kotomachi used that all the time in the most inventive and amazing ways later on, by the way. <laughs> they, they very rarely look like that. And then we've got a gap. Uh, the pause is very important. The pause is teaching you about form. It's saying we have now finished the first part of our two-part composition, and there is a gap. So we have the pause. Then in typical fashion, the second half starts. Sol, mi, do. Yes, uh, the dominant. It starts in the dominant. Now, normally, we would expect this. Sol, mi, do, sol, mi, do the same as we had at the beginning, but this time it truncates. It goes straight to a cadential phrase. Sol, mi, do, do, re, mi, sol, mi, do, re, do. Again, round that first opening triad. If you go down, uh, Nikhil, to the next page, I've actually realized it for you. With a I've added a bass line as well. Uh, sol, mi, do, sol, mi, do, fa, mi, re, do. Sol, mi, do, do, re, mi, sol, mi, do, re, do. Now, notice a few other things I'll just quickly point out. So this is a, basically a reading exercise. It's teaching you to add a syllable to every note. There's no problem working that out. And you learn the patterns. I now know that sol, mi, do is a descending triad. Yes, the triad of the tonic, the triad of the dominant. I also know that fa, mi, re, do is a cadence. You'll notice also that the ambitus of this melody, by which I mean the range of notes, is exactly an octave. 
the highest note is D and the lowest note is D. And that's teaching you how to construct a melody. It's saying you stay within the confines of that octave. There's the octave. Notice the symmetry. Yes, we have a descent through the octave and then an ascent back to the top. So it's got, it's got a beautiful structure. It's got phrasing. It's got, look at the complexity of the rhythms here. At the beginning, we've got two three-note units and then a four-note unit, then a gap. It's teaching. And if you do lots of these things, you start to pick up patterns. So I hope everyone can follow that. Now, uh, uh, Professor got... Baragwana, these lines, yeah. are these part of the manuscript or are you just using no, that to no, illustrate? These, these are added. These are okay. my additions. So okay. the bass line and the slurs are there to perform because another problem we have, of course, it, it's like Bach manuscripts, isn't it? Where there are no slurs and no performance indications. If uh, uh, How do we perform this? How do we phrase it? Now, I would argue that it's pretty obvious. There are three phrases there. It makes no sense at all to do something like this. It doesn't make any sense at all. So the phrasing marks there are to show you how I believe the lesson would have been taught and to show you the, the, the cadence structures, the harmonic structures, the schemata, which are used here. So that's my, my device. And I Great. hope it makes it a bit simpler. No, absolutely. But if yeah. everyone's followed, let's move on now, because this is number seven from Kotomachi. So it's, we're still at the stage, we're adding syllables, and we're just learning very, very basic structures, note for note. By number 11, have a look at this one now. Much more complex, yes, it's got minims and semibreves, but there's a lot of similarities too. This is a, a, a more complex, advanced version of the one we've just done. Now, um, how to solmize this? We're facing here the possibility of what are called traits of vocalization, and that means singing more than one note to a syllable. So the question here, if you start this melody, Sol, it's in G major, by the way. G major, so we've got the G major triad, exactly the same as the one before. Sol, mi, do, la, sol, fa, mi. Now there's a question. If I go to the next phrase, can you all hear that? There's a really obvious pattern going on here. And the second phrase, if I sing it to all the syllables, it makes very little sense. Uh, la, sol, sorry, la, fa, sol, fa. It, it's kind of crazy. But if I sing la, sol, fa, mi, it then corresponds to the phrase before. So I have very clear evidence here that this is sung as two notes to one syllable. The pattern is otherwise makes no sense. It's kind of all over the place. So that tells me that the second bar, I don't need to sing sol, mi, do. I can, it doesn't really matter. I can sing sol, mi, do, la, sol, fa, mi, or sol, la, sol, fa, mi. In which case, the first two bars are actually one note, D. Mm. That's very likely because it's a very common pattern. Sol, la, sol, fa, mi. That's stepwise pattern. So I would solmize it that way. If we go down, Nikhil, please, uh, you'll see my version, my performing version, if you like. Let's make that a little bit bigger. Sol, la, sol, fa, mi. So I've got a, a theme made up of sol, mi, do, this, and I treat it as an extended sol, which is very, very common in later solfeggi. And then we've got what uh, Jerdigan calls a printer, la, sol, fa, mi, six, five, four, three, if you like. The next pattern is obviously the same, but it's in the other hexachord of the key. 
So, as I say, I would solemnize this. La, sol, fa, mi. Then we've got uh, um, a type of modulation. Re, sol, fa, mi, sol, fa, mi, fa, fa, mi, re, do. Notice fa, mi, re, do, the standard kotomachi cadence. If we go back up to the top now quickly, we've now got a, an opening phrase, which has, if you like, a motivo, a motive, which is the triad, with a prina continuation. And it ends on a very weak, imperfect cadence. This is continued in a very typical way by the other prina, the other la sol fa mi of the key. And we've now reached the dominant. And uh, we've now, uh, we've got a thing called a monte, another schema, sol fa mi, sol fa mi. That's a modulation to the dominant and a confirming cadence. Can you see how the same patterns are now being used, but with very slight embellishments? Really not very much, just a little bit. You know, some notes get a, a, two notes or three notes, and that's it. I'll give you a, if we carry on, I don't want to go through every single part, but I'll just get you to the end of this one. The second half after the pause starts in the dominant, which is typical, of course. Same theme. Now we have a sequential pattern, a, a linear intervallic pattern. And then the fa mi re do cadence. So it's teaching how to, it's teaching us several types of continuation. It's teaching us the prina as a continuation of a theme. And here, a sequential passage. That's very useful in counterpoint, by the way. This is very typical in Vivaldi uh, and Bach. Can I ask now, uh, Professor Baragwanath about your use no. of the semicolon? Is that to, is that to demonstrate? Uh, I use that. So my, these are my symbols for performance versions. Um, because I, I discuss in the book how uh, it was considered to have punctuation. There's a lot written about the subject of punctuation in uh, 18th century music. I use the um, comma for, for minor breaks between patterns, and the semicolon means the beginning of a new schema. So a semicolon is demarcates the schema, and you'll see it corresponds with the um, slurs as well in this, mm. in this one. So it's really ways to, to decipher and interpret. And these right. things can be open. Uh, there, there could be several ways of doing this. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And it gets even more difficult, as you were saying, right? Kotomachi goes more and more difficult. Well, we're not going to show. I'm not going to show you the most difficult Kotomachi ones. They're really amazing. I mean, they're just a blur of black <laughs> notes. <laughs> right. But um, this is number 31 of 115. So we're still at the beginning level here. But this one, you can see already, it's much more complicated. It's not as complex as a real melody, if you like. Uh, if you were to look at a, I don't know, a, a saraband or an aria from the period, they would probably be slightly more complex than this. So we're still at the beginning phases. But have a listen to this solfeggio, number 31. first half. So if we can go down, Nikhil, just to see my realization, I hope these help. I think it's much easier to read when I put a bass line and I put slurs mm. in and punctuation. I think it makes more sense of it. Now this opening melody has a very obvious pattern to it. Uh, all I'm doing there, which is very common, is I'm playing the notes on the strong beats. Notes on the beats. You'll see we have a little leap of a third, and then a leap with a descending pattern to make a cadence. The descending pattern at the end is very, very common because it's cadential if it falls. And this is do, re, mi. It's a do, re, mi. And it's obvious, no? So uh, 
I can see that straight away, but it takes time to learn this. And that's a fairly obvious one, but the, the real art of this, if, you've, if you started at Kotomachi number one and you worked through every single one up to number 31, you'd have seen at least 20 or 30 <laughs> do re mis. And so you start to get to know them. And this can be nothing other than a do re mi. There is no way at all this would be sung. Do re mi re sol fa mi re do. Mm. It makes no sense at all. So what we've got here are slightly more complex uh, diminutions, embellishments. This also has um, a prina continuation, la sol fa mi. So here we are. Do, do, re, mi, sol, la, it's quite a strange ending there. Did you see how the me is substituted? Sol, so la, sol, fa, mi should be me on B, but here la, sol, fa, mi. That's an inganno. That's a deceit. That's where the other me of the scale is used, and it leads. Okay, inganno. What's it, what's an ingano? So uh, an ingano comes from Renaissance uh, treaties, basically. It's where you sing the same syllable, but to the other pitch of the scale. So every syllable has two, two pitches. There are two of them. There are two mi's. In the key of G, mi is on B and on F sharp. So here, if we're going from fa to mi, Fa mi. What Kotomachi has done here is fa mi, fa mi, fa mi. He does that a lot later. It becomes That's very beautiful. complex later. So he's 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 tricked us because it should go. It should go la la sol fa mi. But he doesn't want to end on the tonic there. So he does this. La, sol, fa, mi, fa, sol. And he goes to the wrong me early. It's a nice little trick. It's the kind of trick you learn through solfeggio. And we have then um, a modulation. Do, re, mi, fa. And, well, you get the idea. So I, I don't want to go through the whole thing. It's a nice sort of edge But I hope you've got the idea now that to be able to do this, you really need to start with the basic ones, which are much less open to question. So the, the ones where you've got one syllable per note. There's usually very obvious hexachord shapes. And really, most beginners should be able to do these, these note-for-note semibrieve ones. That's brilliant. And then you move on to the ones with minims, and you start to see how... A few little embellishments are added to the same pattern, and gradually they get more and more complex. So, um, and I, I wanted to show you that Kotumachi has his own style. Every maestro had their own melodic style. So Kotumachi loves this. Fa mi re do, that's his favorite cadence. And very few <laughs> others use it as much as he does. So they have their own little fingerprints. You know, right, you can right. see who's, who's is who's. Right. Um, so I've got here an example from Traetta, Tommaso Traetta, the well-known uh, opera composer of the mid-18th century. Um, this is his course of solfeggio. It's a lovely manuscript. And I want to show you this just to show you very quickly uh, that it's similar to Kotomachi, but not the same. So it, it's a very similar approach, but it's got slightly different features and slightly different melodic contours and so on. So if, if uh, this page here, if you can see that, that's actually one of the reading exercises. And you can see this manuscript actually has the, the syllables written in. So these are original. It's from roughly the 1750s. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la. Just a scale. There it is. <laughs> and so this is a reading exercise. It's a very basic solfeggio where you're learning the hexachords. You're learning just to label the notes. Um, and you'll see uh, below, if you go to uh, third system down, can you see? We then have exactly the same scale on the other hexachord. 
So this is this lesson is very obvious. It's teaching you the two hexachords, how to join them, how to get used to them. So you would spend probably, this is going to sound weird, but you'd probably spend at least a year doing this level <laughs> of exercise. <laughs> Yep, because yeah, because you have to learn to read in all the keys and all the clefs, and you have to know you have to read absolutely perfectly. And the other thing to mention is they they usually didn't allow allow the boys at the conservatories to sing until their voices had broken. Now, if you mm -hmm. enter the conservatory at the age of nine or ten, and your voice breaks at the age of thirteen, well, you could spend three years <laughs> doing this kind of spoken solfeggio, yeah, or just going through the melodies and speaking them, not singing them and just getting to know to read the music perfectly. So there's many levels. Well, well, uh, Professor Brad Wendell, didn't they have boys sopranos that sang extremely high? And wasn't that a prize they, thing, like beautiful. Haydn, for instance? Well, yes, they, they did have boys sopranos. That's very true. Um, but if the boys were training to be composers, for instance, uh, they didn't want to damage their voice. There's a lot of talk about how they didn't want to kind of put strain on the voice because it's unnecessary. With uh, uh, castrati and those who might become choir singers, it's a different matter. Mm. So as with all of these things, there's no one simple answer. You know, when we look at a manuscript like this, uh, it could be used for reading out loud. It could be used for singing. Uh, it could be used as a basis for embellishment. It could be used to teach partimento even. You know, these are, you can see embellished bass lines here. <laughs> You see that this is actually a, a type of partimento lesson. So these manuscripts probably had multiple uses. So I'm not able to kind of cover all everything. Right, right. But what I'm showing you here, this is a very basic one. So you can see it's the same as the Kotumachi. It's even simpler in a way. Yep, right. very basic semi-breves. If we go now to a later one, um, I can't remember which ones. Is it this one? We've got. We, we go to the Largo? Yeah, this one, yeah, the Largo. Now, uh, there's the manuscripts. I've actually got a... a transcribed copy, Nikhil. Have you got the PDF? Because it's much easier so. to read. Is it this? Yeah, here. Now, this is num the solfeggio number one. So uh, after uh, Traeta had taught his students to read, they'd done a lot of reading exercises, you start on the solfeggi. So we here's the question. How do we solmize this? simple largo but do we add one note to every note i don't think so i don't think so in this there, there seems to be a very obvious pattern of thirds now you'll know if you've done the basic uh, lessons that they sang scales then they sang leaps meaning leaps of intervals like thirds or fourths or fifths and then they learned cadences so the three basics that they learned in the really early lessons were scales leaps and cadences this one is, to me, obviously based on leaps of the third. If we go down, uh, you can see my performing version. We've got it a bit later. Yeah, here it is. So here's my solution. You'll see I have not added one note, one syllable per note. Do, mi, sol, mi. Can you see in the second bar? Sol, mi. There's an appoggiatura to the E. But you don't sing that. The, the, the appoggiatura does not get a syllable. It, it, it belongs to the me. So it, it's sung as me, which tells me that the first bar, I don't sing the F. So it's, it's teaching me two different ways of notating these inessential notes. One is a passing note. One's an appoggiatura. And you'll see from the remainder, it's all in thirds. Do, mi, sol, mi, fa, re, fa. That slur is original. That's in the original manuscript. And it tells you not to change syllable. So me in C major becomes me in D major, if you like, the dominant of G. Mi, fa. And then we have a new tonic, G major. Carrying on, you'll see the thirds are very obvious. Do, re. That's a very obvious scale, scale pattern. Uh, 
Yeah. So the, what you would have sung in the first lessons as do re mi re do here you sing do re mi re do you add some embellishments. It's even more obvious in the next line, isn't it? Sol fa mi Very simple uh, solfeggio. So at this level, I think it's possible for people, you know, who are readers of the book or interested in this subject to work that out. If it's got lots of leaps of a third, you probably don't sing every note to a syllable. Right, right. But you need to work from the beginning to do that. So that's my brief introduction to um, the way solfeggio teaching worked. You start off very basic, and then they get gradually, gradually more intense. Right. Now, I would say I would make a, a lot of inferences here because there's so much evidence missing. There's so much we don't know. We don't have right. the words of the maestro. But in um, Kotumachi, for instance, he's, he writes 115 solfeggi. And we know that a solfeggio course usually lasted around three years. So I would suggest that these 115 lessons were not uh, covered in the 115 hours. Uh, that probably you spend a whole week at least on one of these, maybe right. longer. And they, they were stretched out over the course of three years. So there's a lot to learn in one solfeggio. And in fact, the ones I've shown you now, can you see how much we learn? We learn how to create themes, how to continue them in various different ways, how to cadence. Uh, so, so we're learning themes, continuations, different types of cadence, cadences which are delayed and deferred, for instance. Is there, uh, a, is there this kind of upends the whole thinking from the bass orientation? Because I think one thing is with the with thorough bass and partimento is we are oriented now to always look at the bass as our entire universe and but is this meant to be complementary or is it meant to really think of us are we supposed to think of the melody first well I, I, when we talk about we that's a different thing um you know what we should do today is open to question in many ways but uh, back in the eight, i can talk about the history of this and back in the 18th century uh, partimento uh, in the early 18th century was certainly a skill to learn how to add basses to melodies because they already knew the melodies, they didn't know the basses. So in that sense, yes, the melody was primary. And in fact, in a solfeggio manuscript, the bass never, ever came first. The bass was always added to the melody, never the other way around. And in fact, the bass was altered. Uh, if the melody didn't fit, the bass was altered, not the melody. So uh, the melody was definitely primary in this. Right. And it teaches melodic composition. Um, for us now, it's, it's complicated because we have a tradition. I, I don't want to go off too much of a digression yeah, here. We have another great example to talk, to, talk about too. Yeah, in, in the 18th century, towards the end of the 18th century, um, the business of music making starts to veer towards the amateur market, the middle class market. So no longer the church and the aristocracy, they don't have any money anymore. And so the, the musicians are trying to sell to a new middle class market. And Part of the, our modern idea of keyboard harmony, the idea of understanding chords from the bass and, and playing at the keyboard, was really designed for that amateur market. And it, it became the basis of what we call harmony now, it was right. uh, essentially the way that amateurs could learn to play the keyboard. Um, you know, so there's a lot of uh, publications, especially German publications, but also French in the 18th century, right. which established this idea of keyboard harmony and tonics and dominance and, and so on. Yep. But uh, the, the real craft uh, yeah. for composition and for singing and uh, virtuosic playing was melodic. The melody was primary. Now, uh, one more question before we dive into this amazing Leonardo or Sala example that we have is, um, I had a question, could you weigh in on this Matheson versus Butstead debate? <laughs> so I know that there is a, it's a big famous historical sort of polemic that happened 
Um, who was right in that instance? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know who's right, but what, what happened with that debate? So it's very simply, Matteson was kind of progressive, uh, trendy, and, you know, wanted to modernize uh, uh, the, the solmization system. And Butchtet was pretty old fashioned. And he said, no, we, we stick to the old ways. That's summarizing it very quickly. But what's happened since then? I mean, this was a localized debate. It's, it's in German. It's in a particular part of Germany. Uh, but what happened is scholars in the sort of 1970s and 80s took this as a kind of universal symbol. And they said, ah, this is the conquest of the old ways. Butchtet is represents the old and matters and the new. So therefore, by kind of 1725, the new is, is there. Mm. And a lot of scholars kind of made this a cutoff date. And it's demonstrous false because we know that the, the old system carries on for at least a hundred years after that mm. and so uh its relevance now is is an example as to how not to universalize a particular mm. so this was a particular debate between two musicians and it became universalized as kind of music history in in a big h mm. so you know oh this is when solmization stops completely Butchtet right. gets told to shut up by Matteson, and he does shut up. It's 1716, wasn't it, his book? But, yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's, it's been made a little bit too important, I think, that debate. But it's right. very characteristic of the time. There are lots of debates like that going on in the right. 1730s, that sort of time. Right. Now, we, we, this is, like, much more advanced than, the, <laughs> the, than what let's, we were... Let's go to the really advanced one. This is a pair of solfeggi. So okay. Uh, can we go can to, you the go to the cantabile? Okay. Yeah, because... Uh, it's very common for lessons uh, to be structured in slow, fast pairs. Very, very common. And my theory on that is it just made a more interesting lesson. So if you have an hour's lesson with students, you don't want to do just one melody. You know, So they did a slow one, half an hour, and then maybe they'd turn to a fast version of the same melody, basically. It's got very similar things. Right. So you have a cantabile way to realize it and an allegro way to realize it. So they're very interesting to look at as pairs. So what we have here is the cantabile, the slow. And it, as you can see from the melody, it looks pretty complex, doesn't it? Uh, there's a lot of notes going on there. <laughs> 30 second notes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So if you carry on, show, show the readers down below. Uh, this is the original bass. You can see, look, that's a very complex melody, yes? Yeah. This is exactly the kind of melody where uh, many musicians would look at this and think, oh, well, that's <laughs> kind of... <laughs> That's too much for me. That's that's a bit too complex. And in terms of solmization, especially today, like well, how could you put a syllable on every single note? Well, you clearly can't. And in fact, if you look at these slurs in this manuscript, these are original. So if you go to the original manuscript, the slurs I've written in here are not mine. Those are the actual ones that are written in the manuscript. And they very clearly show where not to change syllable. So they're, they're, they're telling us that you don't sing all the notes, every note to a syllable. In fact, it would be completely nonsensical. It would make no sense at all. Anyway, as I've shown you, you start with very basic patterns and then you make them more and more complicated. So if we start with this solfeggio, I'll, do, I'll play the first little bit for you. Pretty complex melody, yes? Lots yeah. and lots going on there. Yeah, quite, yeah. quite hard to sing. <laughs> this is a <laughs> lesson in singing you know, as well as anything else. So let's go to the first phrase because it's really obvious, the first phrase. We've got a trait. We have that little mark. It's not a slur. It's, it's kind of related to the slur, but it's used in solfeggio to say do not change syllable. And what it's telling us here is we should not sing the, the um, uh, 16th notes. So we don't sing. If I sing C major, this is do, do, re, re, mi, mi. It's telling us not to do that. It says just ignore. So we sing do, re, mi, re, do. That's so much more logical. 
Yeah, it's and notice there's a beautiful, this is a really well composed phrase. Notice that the rhythm quickens at the end. Do, re, mi, re, do, which imparts symmetry as well as momentum. So the phrase is arch shaped. Do, re, mi, re, do. But because it quickens up, it sounds like it's moving. So it's a very characteristic trick. So now we've got this. I, I, if I try and explain every embellishment, it, it's, it's a lot of words. But to sing it, it's much easier. We've got here a kind of arpeggiation. Mi, he, he. And this is re. D is re. Re, he, he, he. Do. Now, you could sing these three notes. Fa, sol, la. Do, re, mi. Fa, sol, la are both correct. Personally, I believe they would have sung fa, sol, la because they preferred fa and la. They preferred the vowel mm. r. But for modern, uh, modern scholars, modern practitioners, I think it makes more intuitive sense to say do, re, mi. So we'll, we'll do right. do, re, mi. Then we've got a continuation. So do, re, mi, re, do, sol, la. Can you see that that's an arpeggiation of A. And we have yeah. an appoggiatura. Now, I'll give you a basic rule for this, very, very basic rule. Uh, this is my rule, the way I do it. Every syllable note in the melody must have one corresponding bass note. Mm. So even if the bass is very complex, imagine if the bass did this. It could do that, yes? Mm. But one of only one of the notes is the real bass note. The others are, uh, you know, embellishments. So that, those are the real notes. <laughs> but if I embellish them, we've got a lot of notes, but mm. only one of them is the real one, and they correspond. One of the notes in the bass corresponds is a real genuine bass note. The it's so are... crazy how this, when you look at this, but then you can actually just make it a very simplified skeleton, and it's it is just... a simplified skeleton. But if if I if I've been training for a year singing do re mi re do sol la sol fa mi. I know those patterns. <laughs> one year, <laughs> one year. Yeah, and then if I start to embellish, <laughs> do, re, mi, re, do, sol, la, sol, sol, fa, mi. See what I did there? Mm -hmm. So instead of sol, la, sol, fa, mi, which is really boring, you split it into two phrases. Sol, la, sol, sol, fa, mi, which is exactly what's happening here. So after the motivo, the, the, the motive, the theme, which is a do, re, mi, very typical, we then have the printer, la, sol, fa, mi. Sol, la, sol, sol, fa, mi. And the trait there, that line, that uh, slur-like thing, mm -hmm. tells me that fa is held, or f as fa is held all the way through that embellishment. That's all it is. Fa, me. And then take a wild guess at what the next one is. Ready? Can you hear it? So we need to work out what's the main note amongst all those notes, which is the main one. Can you hear it? Fa mi, la sol fa mi, and we can fa la sol 
So if we go down, let's just do it quickly. Go uh, go down to my performance version. So here I've put the syllables in, and I've uh, the slurs are still original. So I haven't added any slurs here. I, I've added the syllables with their punctuation marks. And you see, I, I use a full stop for a perfect cadence. Mm. Full stop is a perfect cadence, uh, or a really major close. Uh, semicolons for major breaks between schemata, and commas just to show minor breaks. So here we go. It start, it's very easy. Do, re, mi, re, do. Sol, ma, ha, so. Sol, fa, mi. Fa, la, so. Half cadence on re. Fa mi fa mi fa mi re. And then we have a fonte. Uh, the fonte. You can see the the. The traits there showing us to sing the same syllable all the way through there. The fonte, I can tell you now, uh, sounds like this. That's a fonte. So it goes. Sol, fa, fa, mi. Or if you like, five, four, four, three in scale degrees. But here, listen to how beautifully embellished it is. Sol, sol, fa. Did you hear it goes down through yeah. the arpeggio? Back up to the sol, and then fa, 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 other fa. So this really complex looking solfeggio is very, very basic, actually. And if we go below, because I don't want to take up too much time, let's carry on. What I've done here, all I've done, this is not really an analysis. All I've done is I've taken away all the embellishment. So I've put only the notes with syllables. Brilliant. And this is what it sounds like. Do, re, mi, re, do, sol, la, sol, sol, fa, mi. La, sol, fa, mi, re, fa, mi, fa, fa, mi, fa, mi, re, fa, mi, re, do, sol, sol, fa, 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 mi, re. Now the next bit is just a scale. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, sol, fa, mi. It's really basic, though. It's just scales. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable it how this skeleton is actually this. That's what it is. <laughs> That's what it is. And so uh, to learn how to do this, you have to, as I say, you have to know the basic ones first. Because what I've got here, that actually looks like bits and pieces from very early solfeggi. That's the same as the kind of early ones you learn. Yeah. Uh, if you go, uh, you know the bit where there's a scale? Let's just have a quick look at that. Go down one system. Can you see I've got a scale here? Yep. If we go to the actual score, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so... So if I can find it. Oh, uh, yeah, I just saw it. But up one. Set it up a little bit. Yep, it's there. It's at uh, the top of page two, yep. 
So the do is the G. Can you see the G? Yeah, yeah. So it goes do re. Did you hear the scale and the sol fa mi? Can you hear the modulation? Sol fa mi in C major, sol fa mi in F major. Very typical turn to the subdominant towards yeah. the end. Yeah. And we heard that. Did you hear how amazingly complex that scale is? Yeah. <laughs> so do do re. There it's like do re. Sol, fa, mi, sol, fa, mi, fa, mi. Yeah, it's it's all there. You can hear it. Brilliant. I mean, this is unbelievable. And and just to end off, Professor Barakwanath. Okay, so people, I think it's it's very exciting what what you just showed us. People are are curious. So. A lot of people in North America do movable dough. A lot of people in Europe do fixed dough. Um, uh, did you have experience with those prior systems before you? Uh, were you a fixed dough person or a movable dough person before you came to this? Um, I can do both. I, I learn both, and I'm very familiar with both. Right, um, right. They, they don't do the same things. In theory, you could do this. So if you uh, fix dough, the syllables are meaningless in everything other than C major. So right. it's, it's, it's not a very helpful system in some ways. It's helpful in others. But in movable do, for instance, why not embellish? If you're singing do, re, mi, fa, right. sol, la, si, uh, and you could still embellish, you know, the patterns. The, the but thing the missing would be the, 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 that semitone, the, the, the focus on the semitone is, is lost. Well, the, the, the syllables make no sense. So <laughs> if, if, the syllables make no sense in movable do. So the, the, they, they won't make sense. If I do... Uh, for instance, um, uh, uh, in movable do, mi, re, do, si, si, la. <laughs> see what it's see, see what I've got? Si, la, sol. It, it doesn't make, you can't get the patterns to work in movable do yeah. because it doesn't use a seven note scale. And when we've got patterns in here, I just did one that went sol, fa, mi, sol, fa, mi. Can you hear how? Yeah. The sol fa mi, there are two of them in each key. And yeah. so uh, the sol fa mi, those both belong to F major. They're both yeah. F major. Yeah. Sol fa mi, sol fa mi. And in movable do, they have different syllables. Yeah. So the, the, the connections between the patterns aren't the same at all. It's much more complex, in fact. Right. So I think that the syllables, because I'm the last one to get hung up on syllables, you know, because you mm -hmm. could say, well, you can call it anything. It's true. But the beauty of the hexachordal system is that, yeah, that's true. You can call it anything, but it's conceptually completely different because you have two six note scales and they map exactly onto each other. Right. So you've got every pattern you learn. There are two places in the key for it to fall. Right. And we have nothing like that in fixed dough or movable dough. There's right. nothing even close. And it's pretty obvious that that was the essence of the system. If you know how they read music, it becomes even more obvious. Because right. they read music using far clefs, they use plain chant clefs. It meant that for them, seeing, a, let's say, sol fa mi on the clef, it kind of, it's, it's difficult to explain this to a modern musician. But for them, the sol fa mi was always the same. It, it, I know it sounds ridiculous, but for us, <laughs> when I see it on, on a treble clef, it's, oh, well, that one's in F major and that one's in C major or something like that. Yeah, yeah. But no, to them on the stave, on the lines, that's a sol fa mi because they know where fa is. So every sol fa mi <laughs> kind of looks the same. You know? And if you're an octave ambitus, then it's quite natural for the two hexachords to, to map, which is the historical system. Right. And so what, what I'm putting across here is a historical truth. And I think I, I, think I can say that now. Right. Uh, this is what they did. And it makes a lot of sense. It's not <laughs> counterintuitive.
And when we it learned, probably in a final wrapping up, which is um, in music history classes, a lot of students, they almost see the Renaissance as a complete alien world that just, just yeah, like, and then, sud- yeah, and then suddenly there's the Baroque and Bach shows up and then he's done with when Mozart arrives, <laughs> and then they all have their own epochs. But this, it almost seems like there's this thread that, that ties, particularly in, I guess, the Catholic, because the Catholic Church was doing this. Um, so I, I had a question to you. Is it truly an alien world, the Renaissance, or is there a little bit more commonality than we are led to believe? I think there's a lot more commonality. Um, I think especially from the, um, from the 1500s until the 1700s, it's, a, it's just one line of tradition. There's, there's no breaks. Uh, there, basically, the fashion of how you embellish things changes. Okay. But fundamentally, the basic music making is, is kind of similar. It's really right. very similar. Because because um, uh, Professor Robert Yerdigan said something kind of wild. He said that you know that it's the in Western harmony you just have one three five and one three six as your basic basic stable chords, and that hasn't changed from Palestrina to the Paris Conservatory even before Palestrina. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, now what you're saying with the solfeggio, perhaps in, in a similar way, the way they learned to sing and the way they learned and saw melodies as early as Palestrina is is there's a lot of connection to them. Yeah, I, I think so. And in fact, we, we've got to be very careful of uh, unilineal histories. You know, the idea of there's, there's a line and it just goes the same in all places and, and all times. Not at all. So for instance, um, I point out in my book that in the 1760s in Portugal, they were still using the Renaissance system, completely unchanged. <laughs> it, was, it was exactly the same as Palestrina would have used. <laughs> And um, this is documented. And, and, and actually, at that time, this trendy new Italian system was being introduced um, in, in Lisbon. And they were all sort of, wow, wow, what's this new, <laughs> you know, what, you can change keys, you know? So, so <laughs> when we talk about Renaissance, it was still alive. The Renaissance system was still being used in the 18th century in right. some places. Probably in many places, provincial places. <laughs> well, well, what can I say? The great Professor Nicholas Baragwan, please, any, so do you have any plan of uh, these practical materials? And I also want to mention the Art of Solfeggio Facebook group. Please subscribe to that group. There's a lot of work and, and people sharing materials. It's a very nice group to join. Um, so, yeah, you were mentioning uh, practical things. Is that in the works? Yeah, I've done so much work on this, but there's so it's so difficult. Um so I've I've um, I've uh, realized and interpreted and commented on hundreds and hundreds of solfeggi, but I need to get them all together in a collected textbook. It's a phenomenally difficult thing to do because you know there's so many decisions that have to be made when doing something right. like this. But right. I don't see any other way forwards um, because I, I I'm not one of these scholars who thinks you have to have a smoking gun for every. Uh, you know everything you present you know so I, in this subject this is a was an oral tradition so obviously we're going to have to try and infer things that are missing right. and that's exactly what I try to do and my interpretations are open to question you know even I I question them myself in, in right. parts and I encourage people to do this because that's the only way we're going to get to learn more about this right uh, given that we're not likely to find some amazing source you know manuscript which tells us all the secrets I, I, this is exactly unlikely. how you do it <laughs> yeah exactly that, that's not going to happen um i don't at least i don't think so uh, we basically have to if it is going to happen it's probably going to be a german lawyer somewhere from the 18th century <laughs> <laughs> i would love it to happen but i've searched and searched and i, and I, yeah. I found everything i could find um yeah. things will keep coming up you know yeah. and little bits of information, but we're not going to get some golden ticket that tells us everything in factual. No, so we have to infer and we have to say, right, what's the most likely thing? Right. And we do that through practice. And so I'm trying to encourage this at the moment. So yeah, um, I, I've got a lot of stuff built up in the pipeline, which needs to be published. And I'm going to try and get on with it as soon as I can. Great. That's wonderful. Well, I mean, the great Professor Nicholas Barakwanath. And I have to say there was a, 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 a very high up part of mentor scholar who said to me, you know, that that Nicholas Baragwanath is brilliant. You know, I think I've even heard that he has a photographic memory. <laughs> like he's got all these solfeggio or something. <laughs> and and there's, there, there's a lot of people who are very excited about this. And, That's um, very kind of you. When, um, when I was a music student, I was famous for this because I could cite any page yeah, number. Yeah, so you have a photographic memory. 
it's not as good as it used to be. I think I'm fading with age. But yeah, in the past, I, when, when I read books, I can remember the page numbers and things like that. <laughs> Weird stuff. Yeah. That's incredible. Well, I mean, uh, there's a lot of people who say private meet to me. He's, he's, he, actually, one thing they said is, it's very rare in music theory. This is what he said to me. He said, it's very rare for someone to come along with something so bold like this and, and so changing. So I, I think you're no, doing I think something. It's very kind of you. It took yeah. me 10 years, by the way. So I spent... <laughs> I researched this for 10 years and I can tell you now, uh, hand on heart, that for the first seven of those, I had not a clue what was going on. So I just right. kept pushing it. I kept thinking there's got to be an answer to this. There's, this has to make sense. Right. And for seven years, it didn't make sense. I was like everybody else at the time. It just doesn't make sense. <laughs> and then uh, a few things clicked into place. I, I was very lucky. I found a few manuscripts that had some things in them and I found a few traces here and there. And I, I gradually, it took seven years to actually come put a theory together that kind of could be backed up with evidence. So it was a really tough job, actually. Yeah. It, didn't, it wasn't easy. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not easy. And, and, I, and we really appreciate your work. And so again, the, the book is The Solfeggio Tradition. Please buy it because there's only one of it that talks about this. And I think my prediction, this form of solfeggio is going to make waves very soon. And you're going to find especially in my channel, a great supporter of this. So the great Professor Nicholas Baraguan, thank you so much for showing thank your you materials. Nicholas, and, sharing, and I'll talk Thanks to you soon. Bye-bye right. now. Bye, everybody. Thank you.